All right, folks, welcome to the Team VTAC podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Lamb, and this is also going to be done up as a done as a spun up uh, vidcast. And maybe today we should call this stirring the pot. Um, I started using Squadcast here. They asked for my pronoun. I put Kyle Lamb stirring the pot. Stirring the pot, that's not really a pronoun, but that's what I'm going to stick with for today. So last one I was commando, and I thought that might be a little too aggressive, so I went with just stirring the pot. So the first thing I want to talk about today is I'm actually going to take the, I'm going to, I'm going to jump right underneath of the oncoming bus here. One of my buddies, John LaBella, good friend of mine, he he said, yeah, listen to your podcast. I'd like you to talk about 1911s versus striker fired pistols and that is holy buckets that you want to talk about opening a can of worms so what he said initially when we talked on the phone he said well you got all these parts all these moving parts in this 1911 and the the striker fired guns are are more simple there's less parts and i said well are you sure about that he said well, it sounds like you have the answer. And honestly, I don't have the answer, but here's where I'm going to go with this. So in the 1911, to me, is a is a very simple, simple weapon system. So it's it's very simple for that to, to function. Um, I'm not going to say to function correctly, because maybe that's a little bit more difficult to get it to function correctly. But I feel like it's a very simple system to... To gunsmith on anyway, I believe it is. The, the parts are very simple to to install. I would say that some of these striker fired guns have a whole lot more craziness going on there. Now that being said, if you're a if you're a 1911 guy, you probably don't want to hear me say that the Glock is a is a cool weapon, and that's one of the first striker fired guns that I ever laid my hands on. Now we have the P320, which I think is an awesome gun. You've got the guns. Um, Walther PPQ, another striker fired gun. You've got the uh, Smith and Wesson M and P. These are really good guns. So I I really like the 320, but that doesn't mean that it's that it's significantly better than any of these of these others. It might be a little easier to shoot. The trigger might be a little bit better, but if you find somebody that's a diehard Glock guy or diehard 1911 guy, they don't want anything to do with the 320. So. I don't want to sit on the fence here because I think that sitting on the fence causes you to get a lot of slivers in parts of your body that it's not really easy to remove the sliver. So I'm going to jump right in to what I believe. I believe that the 1911 is an awesome weapon system. And I believe that a striker fired gun, if you choose the right one, is more awesome than the 1911. Now, those of you guys that just went out and spent, you know, $3,000 on a staccato are going to be pissed off about that, but man, it the the 1911 requires a little bit more love than a striker fired gun. Back in the day, we had these beautiful 1911s built for us. They were amazing. Uh, we could make it almost through four magazines without a malfunction, and those were eight round magazines. So in 32 rounds with these guns, normally we'd have a malfunction. So these were the brand new, brand new bunch of guns. I was very disappointed in it, so we decided we were going to look at other pistols and try to make that selection. Now, a buddy of mine, Larry Vickers, at the time said, well, we can't look at the 40 because the 40 Smith & Wesson is a crappy cartridge. You should look at the 9 millimeters." I kind of fought him on that. Well, no, I actually fought him pretty hard on that because I thought the 40 was a significantly better cartridge, but the 40s in the Glock are just not as reliable as the 9 millimeters. so he was... 100% correct there. So the Glock 17, we at the time we actually had, I believe the 45 gap we tested as well. We got back some of the testing and one of the guys told me, well, look at this, they have the same amount of L functions. And the way that the report was written, it said that we had the 1911, and I'm going to make up the numbers here, but it's you'll get the idea. The 1911 and the Glock both had eight malfunctions. And I went, holy cow, man, the 1911 did better than I thought it was going to do. And then I went and got the actual report and read it. And what happened was the 1911 fired nine rounds, had eight malfunctions. 
the Glock fired, I want to say it was 400 rounds or it was a lot of rounds. And this was in the earth, wind and fire test or the sand, wind and dust test. It had the same amount of malfunctions, but it, it, it fired, I don't know how many times more ammo that is, but the striker fired gun was just, it, it was way, way, way more reliable than those 1911s that we had at the time. Now, if you've bought a Staccato, I hope the gun works. I hope you can keep that gun running and I hope it is amazing and you're good to go there. I would say this, it's a little bit harder to gun to manipulate as a new shooter because you have several safeties to worry about. If you have a grip safety, that's something that some of us have a difficult time because I have a very high grip on the gun. I normally disabled my grip safety. If you buy a Staccato or you buy any 1911, and you're having trouble with that, you you are taking a safety out if you take the grip safety out of the gun. But for me, that's what I had to do. The thumb safety on the 1911, I believe, is a very, very, very good part because you can quickly get the gun into action and still deactivate that safety just like you would on an AR. It's different, obviously a different safety. It's not a, a circular safety like on the AR. It's just a, a, a place to put our thumb. I would also say this on the 1911, that having that purchase of your thumb on the thumb safety gives you additional torque on the weapon. So ideally it is gonna help with recoil. So if you have a nine millimeter Staccato, the gun's probably gonna be heavier than a P320. It's probably gonna be heavier than a Glock. It's gonna re recoil less because of that. It should anyway. And then if you have that thumb safety and you keep your thumb on the safety while you're shooting, that should help give you leverage on the gun. Some folks would say, well, it's not ambidextrous. Well, you can get an ambidextrous thumb safety that works excellent on that pistol. So train with that gun and use that thumb safety, of course, uh, because you can get a better trigger on a lot of those 1911s. If you have a gun like, you know, a gun that Rob Latham would shoot, you might have a two pound trigger in that gun, might not be the trigger you want in a carry gun, but that's uh, that's available. I mean, you can do a very, very good trigger on the 1911. So where do I stand? I am going to pick the 320 and behind the 320, I would probably pick the Walther PPQ. Behind that, I would probably pick the Smith & Wesson M&P. And behind that, I would pick the Glock. Now, the I'm not saying the Glock is unreliable. Please don't, please don't say that. I'm saying that the Glock is harder for me to shoot than definitely harder than the 320 and the M and P and the Walther PPQ. So that's why I would pick them. Is the Glock a reliable weapon? Doggone right it is. If you want reliability and the ease of gunsmithing, that's a great gun to choose. If you want to do some gunsmithing on a 320, it's a little bit more difficult than a Glock to work on, but it's still a pretty simple system. I say that, and then the next time I go to change a spring, I'm going to be cussing the designer for trying to twist these springs and get them put back in the gun the way they're supposed to be. But one of the things I've noticed with my 320s is they just run and run and run and run. I have 21 round magazines for my 320. Yeah, I love that. I absolutely love that gun. Now, I'm going to go even a step further. Let's talk about the other single action guns that are out there that you would carry as a concealed carry weapon. I probably wouldn't carry the Staccato or a full size 1911 as my concealed carry. I just wouldn't do that. It's, it's just too big of a gun. I would carry a gun like the Smith & Wesson M&P Shield, which I carried for many years. But then I upgraded to the P365. The reason I upgraded was because the P365 was less recoil, more accurate, and I had more ammo in it. Um, and I have messed with some of the Glocks, the small Glocks. The, the thing I don't like about the small Glocks is they're they're very hard to hang on to while you're shooting them. And I feel like there's more recoil. I might just be feeling that because I'm not a I'm not a Glock guy anymore. Um, I was a Glock guy in the Army because I was issued a Glock 19. And I carried that on several deployments with extended magazines, plus fives on a, on a Glock 17 magazine. So if you do the math, that's like 22 rounds. That's pretty good uh, firepower in a Glock 19. Also was issued a Glock 26. That gun seemed to work pretty well. I would say it's 
not as reliable as a Glock 19 and definitely not as reliable as a Glock 17. So if I was going to pick a nine millimeter Glock, I would pick the Glock 17 for the reliability. If I was going to pick an M and P or correction, a, well, let's talk about the M and P. If I was going to pick an M and P, I would probably pick the nine millimeter as well because the other, the others out there, the ammunition is hard to get to. And uh, one of the issues I had with my M and P, it wasn't very accurate. I think they've fixed that problem since with my 320s, I have, they're very reliable and I have very good, um, very good accuracy. Now I do work with Smith, with, uh, with SIG. So don't, you got to take everything I say with a grain of salt because I'm a SIG guy. But if you shoot my SIGs, you're probably going to start to like the way they run. Recently, my buddy, Lynn Ashley, and I decided to shoot the uh, EDC championships up at uh, SIG Academy. If you know Lynn, he used to be with FN. He uh, cut that away like a bad parachute, and now he's working for Surefire. So we decided to go up there and shoot that match. And I said, well, what gun are you going to shoot? Because you got to shoot a 365. And he says, well, I want to shoot a, an XL. And he, at the time, he didn't even own a 365. And I said, all right, well, I'll shoot an XL as well. And at that time, I didn't own one either. I'd shot one, but I didn't own one. So I got a hold of a uh, P365 XL. He got one and he started shooting it. And he called me up and he was in love with this thing. Now, I will tell you this, the 365 is a little bit harder to reload for me, but the 365 XL, I can actually reload that gun. It's still not as fast as a full size 320, but I feel like I can get, I had Justin up at SIG show me a little trick of putting his fingers. He's got really long fingers, like, like wizard fingers. You know what I'm saying? And, and wizard fingers, if you go into a 7-Eleven and they got those big foot long hot dogs rotating in there, if they've been on there over 36 hours, they're called wizard fingers. And his fingers look just like that. So that's what that's if you picture his hands, that's what they look like. So with those long fingers, he's able to push his fingers out behind the frame, push that gun out a little bit and get the magazines to drop. So that's the way that I've been practicing with that. One of the things I was surprised about the 365, the 365 is a very good gun to carry in an ankle holster. And I know a lot of you are going to say, well, an ankle holster is stupid. Yep, probably is unless that's the only thing you can use because of what you're doing that particular day or because of what job you have. Maybe you cannot carry on your waist. I like the 365 and I like the shield for that and the Glock as well. The small Glocks will fit on your ankle. The 365 XL, a little bit too big for me to carry on my ankle. That's my opinion. Um, even with the short magazine, I feel like it's just a little bit too big and it is harder to find pants now that have big enough of a ankle in the in your uh, or a cuff in your pants to be able to do that so 365 is my choice there but 365 xl carrying that on my waist appendix carry i don't feel like it's any more difficult to carry than a 365 now i'm a big dude so that's maybe that helps too but i would definitely give the 365 and the 365 xl um a shot there now if you are going to get these small glocks I would contact the jokers at shield for their magazines shield arms makes magazines for these guns. Uh, Seth Bergley, a friend of mine out in Montana. If you have one of those small guns, get their magazines. It'll help you get a little bit closer to the capacity might even take you to the same capacity as a 365. I don't recall off the top of my head. I normally shoot the 365, so I don't have to worry about using those, but their mags, they, they just, function great. They look great. The, the base pads are awesome. So check those guys out at shield. If, uh, if, uh, if you're looking for mags for that Glock. Okay. So back to the 1911, I don't think it's as reliable. I'd get a striker fired gun if I was betting my life on it. And, uh, a lot of guys say, well, you carried one. Well, for example, when I was in Somalia, when we had a little gunfight going on over there, I didn't even carry a pistol. I carried a, my, my backup was a sawed off 870 shotgun that I carried for breaching doors. I just didn't have room for a 1911 and I just didn't feel like it was going to work for me in, in a uh, sugar cookie environment like that. So that was my, that was my choice for the global war on terror. I carried the Glock and now I'm carrying the, uh, I, I shot a Smith and Wesson. I worked with Smith and Wesson for years. 
and I really like the M and P. I made the transition pretty quickly to a to a P three twenty, and then we built the uh, X frame, and I, I helped a little bit with that, but really that was really I didn't have much to do with it. But the X frame is a just a sweet sweet frame on the three twenty. So I prefer to shoot the X frame, and then I have a a, a buddy of mine. Oh, McCole that does some texturing on those for me and put some grip. It's it's aluminum oxide. I believe that's what it is. It's not grip tape. It's actually glued right onto the gun. And I really, really like that on the guns that I teach classes with. Now for my carry gun, I don't do that because I want the gun to be able to, to not grab my clothes. But for the guns that I'm shooting on the range or carrying when I'm hunting and doing things like that, that's what I have. And for home protection, same thing. I've got that's the gun that's in my holster on my battle belt that's standing by for me to get, you know, pick it up. And then I've also got a flashlight on that gun. All right. So you 1911 shooters don't get, you know, don't be upset. If you want to carry 1911, carry 1911. You guys that carry Glocks, don't be upset because I don't carry a Glock. I've, I own about, I probably own 20 Glocks. And for years and years, I shot those guns a lot, but I've found guns I can shoot better and I can definitely shoot a 1911 better than a Glock as well. But for my everyday carry, I'm going to be carrying the, uh, the SIG. If nobody was paying me right now, if nobody paid me, I would carry the 365. So there you have it. I don't feel like I'm challenged with ammo because I can carry 12 round flush fit and I've got 15 rounders as, as well. And I wouldn't doubt if they come out with an extended even more of an extended mag or maybe Seth out there at shield could make an extended mag, like a 21 rounder. That'd be cool for the 365 XL. Okay. The next question, my buddy, Josh, he, uh, we had Chow the other day. And one of the questions he asked me after Chow, I'd said, Hey, think of some ideas for podcasts of stuff I can talk about when I'm just doing this by myself. And he said, he wanted me to talk about home invasions and training for those home invasions. Okay, this is such a can of worms. And I think that if you look at what my pronoun is during the pot, maybe you could change that to can of worms. So if you're if you're listening to this as a podcast, you have no idea what I'm talking about. If you're watching this on a video on YouTube, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. For home invasions, here's what I would say. You got to you got to be trained now, you're lucky because you live in your home that you're talking about having invaded. So you should be able to train in your home once you get the knowledge base. It's easy to train in your house. You can set up targets. You know where every nook and cranny's at. You can have gear stashed here and there, however you need it. You can have gear on your body. Your family can help you support you, know, support you for that. You can support your family. You can have flashlights stashed everywhere. Home invasion, you should be absolutely prepared for that. Now, if you have children or grandchildren or brothers or sisters that you don't trust with guns, then I would say, you know, you got to have those guns stashed where they can't get to them. If you're going to do that, I would suggest either having a, sm a small gun safe, you know, close to your bedroom or in your bedroom, or um, Hornady makes some really cool little gun vaults that you can use and we have several of those. Just understand that kids can figure out those codes, maybe not on purpose, but when they play with that thing enough, they'll figure that out as well. So I would still put that in a place where it's difficult for them to get to and then have it locked and have the ability either use the bracelet that they have that you can grab that to, to RFID it or know the code so that you can just punch in the, the uh, code real quick to open it up and get to your, your weapon. I also like to have a long gun. I prefer a long gun, a M4 type, you know, AR-15 type gun. One of the reasons I like that is you have less penetration. So if, if you miss a target, you have a better chance of those bullets stopping with a rifle than you do with a nine millimeter or 45 or shotgun slugs. If you don't believe me at that, go research it and you'll start to understand that that's a true statement. That being said, I still don't like to carry super lightweight bullets. I'm not going to carry a 50 grain or a 52 grain in my rifle. I may carry a 55, but normally I'm going to carry a 60 or heavier bullet for home protection. I do have some 55 grains and some 60 grain V maxes, 
Not the greatest home defense round, but I have I do have those loaded in some of my some of my guns. What I like about that bullet is if you do miss your intended target, that bullet's going to come apart when it hits when it hits a wall. It's it's a devastating round, but that devastation you may also not get the penetration that you need if you're shooting at somebody that's relatively large. So get that training that you need. Who would I recommend? I would call SIG Academy, Viking Tactics. There's 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 plenty of people out there that that are doing stuff like this. We actually have a class coming up at SIG. We're calling it the uh, Singleton Singleton CQB. So for guys that are not operating on a team, guys and gals, they can show up and they can learn how to clear their clear uh, the structure that they're dealing with by themselves. That's not easy and it's not pretty, but it's something that we should work on doing. Now, I would I would tell you this, if you can get into a class where you're doing two or four man close quarter battle, do that because it's going to make you understand all those different areas that you have to cover. And then you can do that as a, a singleton. Or as I told my buddy, Alan Elishwitz, I said, we'll do it as we'll call it simpleton CQB. And really, that's what we're trying to do. Keep it as simple as possible and don't violate any of those rules and get in there and learn how to clear your clear your house. Josh, that's probably not going to answer your whole question, but that's a, I, I don't know what I don't know how to go any more in depth on that without doing an instructional video. And maybe that's something we need to do. We need to talk about how to clear some of these areas there. A few rules, and I just mentioned that I do want to I'll, I'll hit on those real quick. First of all, if we start closing the gap on doors in our houses, if you don't have walls that will stop bullets, you better have a reactionary gap, which means stay away from the fatal funnel, the doorway, stay away from that doorway until it's time for you to enter. Clear as much of that room as you can before you make that commitment to go in the room. If you're with a team, that's a different story because we still don't want to get close to the doors because bullets will go right through the wall there. So stay out of the fatal funnel, have a reactionary gap. So if somebody comes around that corner and surprises you, you don't shoot the wrong, shoot the wrong person. That's why we have that. Also, if we've closed that gap and they come around, there's a good chance they can grab your weapon before you get the weapon into operation. So we want to have a little bit of a gap. Natural reactionary gap for me is probably about arm's length, which is about six foot. Give or take that. That's that's what I would say. That doesn't mean that somebody can't still move fast enough to invade my space. That just means that if they shoot around that door, if I'm six foot away from that door, hopefully they won't shoot that far from the doorway through the wall. Second thing is you got to clear your corners when you do make entry into that room. So if you're working on clearing your house, and when you do this, do it with an unloaded weapon, do it with airsoft, do it with something that's going to be safe, do it with a blue gun or red gun, whatever color your fake gun is, and make sure you're clearing your corner. So one of those corners can be somewhat clear before we enter, and then we're going to clear the opposite direction. Now, when we do team movements through a building like that, I always hear, well, you always want to go path of least resistance. Okay. I'd probably disagree with that because... Number one guy, path of least resistance, maybe he's already seen that corner and he decides that he wants to button hook. Number one guy is always right. So number two guy then gets the path of least resistance, which means they're going to get into the room quicker together as a team versus if the number one guy takes the path of least resistance, number two guy takes the button hook, there's going to be a bigger gap between those two shooters. Another thing that I've seen is uh, folks like to, and this is a special forces thing that I've seen, not everybody, but I've seen some units that are trying to do a combat clear for everything. Just remember the combat clear was made for doing stuff overseas where we had walls that would stop bullets. And also that's used at night when we got night vision goggles. So don't, I would not apply a combat clear to every thing that you're doing. I've heard some SWAT teams now are starting to do combat clears and that's actually pretty goofy for a SWAT team to be training to do that. If they're doing that at night, that's fine. It's it's a um, it's not an aggressive movement. So I would tell you, train to be aggressive, and then if you back down, you can do the combat clear, and that's just pying from outside the room before you make entry. One of the reasons these SWAT cops are doing this is they say that they want to be able to fight from the doorway. The last place I want to be is standing in a doorway when I'm in a gunfight, because if I'm in a doorway, what does that tell you? 
a bad guy. All they got to do is shoot at my outline in the doorway. They shoot at the doorway. They're going to hit me. I'm going to be bottlenecked in the doorway. It's just a bad, it's just bad all the way around. If you don't have to enter, then don't even get in the doorway. Don't, why are you even going in the building? Why are you going in that room if you don't have to? If it's hostage rescue, we've got to get in the doorway. So then you can't fight from the doorway. You've got to get in the room and collapse your sectors, kill the bad guy, save the good guy, kiss babies, whatever you do after that. High five, slap each other on the butt, do whatever your pronoun allows you to do. I'm going to keep stirring the pot. So there you go. Um, rear security. That's difficult when we're doing this by ourselves, but that basically means having your head on a swivel. So make sure as you're doing this, you're always looking left and right and being switched on to what's going on behind you, not just what's going on in front of you. Because normally that's an area that we we tend to drop rear security, not a good thing. And uh, we've had bad guys sneak up behind us before. Law enforcement, you can tell stories about that and military guys can do the do the same thing. If you're in your home, yep, you should know what's going on, but you should still keep your keep your head on a swivel there. Okay, another thing that I hear a lot, and now I'm just once again stirring the pot, but I hear guys say, wherever your gun points, wherever your eyes go, your gun has to point as well. That is ridiculous. Now at night, yes, we're going to have to put our weapon there because we're going to have to light it up with a light. Unless we have night vision goggles, then we might still have to be, give a little bit of laser uh, infrared laser or something to give us enough light so we can actually see in our night vision goggles. But if if you're looking everywhere through your sights, you're going to be extremely slow. So what I would say is let your eyes lead you to that target. So when I come into a room and if I'm by myself, it's a home invasion scenario, I'm going to clear the corner with my eyes. If I need to get my weapon there, my weapon is in a position where I can quickly move it there in the first place, but then I'm going to quickly drive my eyes to the opposite corner. My weapon starts to move there, but as soon as my eyes get there and my weapon's not there, I can start my eyes collapsing my sectors in that room. Okay. So there's, it's, it's not a good technique. It's way, way, way slow. If you start looking through your slight sights and clearing through your sights or point your gun everywhere that your eyes go. So make sure that that's not, not really the case. Now, one other thing I probably should have brought up before all of this, if it's a home invasion. Why don't you just go take cover and call the cops? Well, that's good. Do that. But what if your family, what if your kids, your daughter is on the other end of your house and you don't know what's going on or worse yet, you hear them screaming that somebody's in their room. Are you going to just retreat to your bedroom and call the cops and then wait for the next hour for them to show up or 20 minutes or whatever? What, what can happen to your child in that amount of time or to your wife or your husband? I would say train for the worst, which is you're going to have to fight your way there and then eliminate that threat and help your family member out. I also heard a guy the other day say that he would he'd start hollering if he heard that. I probably wouldn't, I, I probably wouldn't do that. I would probably move there as fast as I could, keeping the element of surprise. If your kid is screaming, that's hopefully that's going to jack up the bad guy a little bit and then upset mom and dad can show up with guns and take care of what's happening there. I will tell you in my house, if something happens, my wife is going to beat me to that room. That's just the way it is. One, she wakes up a whole lot faster than I do. Two, she has better hearing than I do. And three, she's a mom and a grandmom. That's an animal you don't want to mess with. So make sure that you can keep up with uh, the other members of your family and make sure those other members of your family have the training that they need so that they can, they can make it happen. I was doing a writer's event one day and I met a fella and he said that his home defense weapon is a was a Smith & Wesson M&P 1522 long rifle with a red dot on it. And I forget what those mags hold. They're like 25 rounds or something. Loaded up with stingers. And he said he loads them up with stingers because it's an effective round. And the reason that that's a home defense weapon is because he's got a teenage daughter and she could handle that weapon. That says it all to me right there. Would a 22 long rifle be my first choice? Nope. But if that's all that they can fire, all that they can handle, man, that is a great choice. Can you imagine getting shot with 20 rounds of stingers? 
That would not be fun. Okay, so hopefully they, that that just stirred the pot enough to get you guys uh, somewhat interested there. The next thing I want to do, put my spectacles on here real quick, and I want to talk about some of the books I've been reading. First of all, Jack Carr, The Devil's Hand. I listened. I did not read this. I got this book from Jack. Even got even autographed it to somebody. I don't know to somebody here. Billy, who's Billy? No, it says my name. But anyway, Jack Carr, The Devil's Hand. I listened to this on Audible. I didn't actually read it. I listened to it. I will tell you, it on Audible, it was amazing. And I'll, the reason it was amazing to me was because there's a lot of dialogue in this book. And listening to that, the guy that reads it, I think his name is Porter, does a spectacular job with that. Another book that I just finished is called The Great Game, The Struggle for Empire in Central Asia by Peter Hopkirk. I believe this book was written in the early 90s, but it covers the the race or the great game surrounding Afghanistan, India, China, and it deals with Russia and England and what they were doing during that great game. So it's 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 spy stuff. What they were doing to try to go through Afghanistan and then they were trying to get uh Russia wanted to get into India. England want to keep them out. Afghanistan was this prize that everybody wanted at the time. And that continued for, wow, it's still going on. Well, I guess it's not going on anymore because we just pulled out of there. But what was crazy about that, when I was reading The Great Game, I was reading a couple other books at the same time about that area. And those books were, were covering significantly different times in history. And they all said the same thing. So go to Afghanistan and eventually they're going to cut your heads off and that's what was going on then and that's what went on now so the great game peter hopkirk read that book awesome the next book um and these are books that i've read in the last couple months i wanted to and i've got quite a list i, I do a lot of reading so the next one is called uh, the apostle a life of paul by john pollock i would highly recommend this book it's uh, if you and, and if, if if you guys like war stories, Paul the Apostle is a good dude to read about. And if you want to learn about how to uh, go through an interrogation, he's another good guy to read about. If you want to go with travel, my, my computer has started to make has started talking to me here. So let me get this shut down real quick. Okay, hopefully you guys are still there. Um, the next thing I want to talk about are some of the books that I've, I've, I've listened to on Audible. So the first one, The Gray Man by Mark Greeny. If you are former military or law enforcement or active duty military or law enforcement, and you want a really good laugh, you should listen to The Gray Man. It is the most ridiculous. It's, it's, it's terrible. He uses words that I don't even understand, like pavement artist. He used that word a hundred times in this book. Maybe not a hundred, maybe 150. Um, totally fictitious, uh, terrible, terrible book. So The Gray Man, Mark Greeny. Hopefully, Chili, if you're listening to this, hopefully you guys, the, the movie's better than the book because the book sucks. I hope somebody got offended by that. Somebody's going to say, oh, he's the greatest writer of all time. All right, that's good. Then you buy all of his books and read all of them because I'm done. The next book is The Afghan by Frederick Forsyth. I really like Frederick Forsyth. I'm listening to another one of his books now called The Cobra. I don't like that because his characters, he's got this president named Obama and his wife's name is Michelle. And he says she's beautiful. And I'm like, I wanted to throw up. But The Afghan is a really good book. And I've read, I've listened to several of Frederick Forsyth's books on tape. I've never actually read one. I listen to his on Audible because they're easy to listen to. I already talked about The Devil's Hand, Jack Carr. Go get that book. It's awesome. Okay. I read several Stephen Pressfield books. The first one was called Do the Work. Very easy read. I don't know if I would recommend it, but if you're trying to write a book right now, that probably wouldn't be a bad one to read. Another book that he wrote is called The War of Art. Another one I don't think I would recommend it, but if you're writing a book, you might want to read that as well. But now this other book that he's that he wrote is called The Lion's Gate, and it talks about um, Israel and the the war of I think it was like '67. 
I might be off on those dates, so don't beat me up on that. But the Lions Gate is really interesting because, and I, I believe I talked about this on a podcast uh, with my buddy um, Harrison Cohn. That's another good book. If you haven't read Saber Down, that's an awesome book to read too. We already talked about that one a little bit though. But the Lion's Gate, every chapter starts out with a, a just a slight vignette and it tells you who you're going to read about now, it, it, but they're the ones that he's quoting. It's, it's what they said. It is amazing. So if you love Israelis, read the book. If you don't love Israelis, read the book. It's an awesome book, The Lion's Gate. Okay, the next one is called Fault Lines. And this is a book by a guy named Vodi Bachman Bauckham Jr. He's a, uh, a pastor. He moved back over to, not moved back, but he, his family, I believe, comes from, uh, from slavery. And he actually moved to Africa four or five years ago. His book is called Fault Lines. I would highly recommend that as well. Um, it, he talks a lot about um, critical race theory and he's not for it. And uh, it's a good book. It's a really good book. I, I, it, it's probably not the easiest read and you might have to do a little research while you're reading it, but it's a pretty good book. Okay, the other book on my list here is called Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky. So I started reading some of his stuff because I was embarrassed that I never read this Russian writer's writing and I thought I would try to read it. And I did, and I, I actually like it. I keep reading Dostoevsky because I believe that at some point there's going to be a happy ending. But then you got to refer back to the point that he's a Russian writer. There is no happy ending. So Crime and Punishment, once again, not a happy ending, but it's a it's a pretty doggone good book. One of the books I don't have written here is I just read um, Moby Dick by Herman Melville. That was a waste of my time. When I was a kid, I was supposed to read it. I never read it. I read the whole book here a month ago. It, it's interesting. It's just kind of a goofball book. So it's a classic. I guess they were hurting for classics. So they picked Herman Melville and uh, you learn a lot about whales. You learn about a lot about whale hunters, but it's kind of a goofy book there. I made it through it, but I make it through a lot of goofy books. Okay. These next books are, th these would be highly recommended books. The book that I talked about, the Apostle, the Apostle, a life of Paul, I would highly recommend that. The Great Game, I would highly recommend. And then these two books. The first one is The War of 1812. That's not what it's called. It's called 1812, Napoleon's Fatal March on Moscow by Adam Zamoyski, Z-A-M-O-Y-S-K-I. Highly recommend this book, but have your big boy britches on or big girl britches on when you read this book because it is it will tear your heart out. If you don't know about his march on Moscow during that winter, he uh, started out with like 400,000 and lost all but 25,000 or something to that, something to that effect. It, it is crazy how many people that he lost there. Crazy. Read that book, 1812, Napoleon's Fatal March on Moscow by Adam Zamoyski. Read it. You've got to read this book. Read that before you read the next book, which is Waterloo by... Uh, Bernard Cornwell. I don't know if Bernard Cornwell has written many history books. I believe this is the only one. I think all of his other books are fictions based on fact, which they're great reads as well. But this is a true story, Waterloo, which took place in 1815. And I'm not a big fan of Napoleon, but I'll give this guy props here because he was uh, stuck on an island under guard lock and key, maybe not lock and key, but definitely guarded. His guard had had decided he's going to go see his girlfriend on another island. And Napoleon had had a boat fixed up so that he could use it if he wanted to. I don't know why they gave him a boat, but he had a boat. So he decides to take off from this island and he heads over to the mainland of France and then uh, takes him a couple days to make it from the coast 
to Paris. And by the time he gets to Paris, he's put together an army and then he marches off to Waterloo and that battle ensues. You need to read this book. I don't know why some people look at what he did at Waterloo as a significant deal other than I guess he fought two other militaries there. So maybe that should teach us not to fight on two fronts, which they were pretty close, but yeah, he got his little French butt kicked there as well. Um, he did some other things, I guess that were great. I haven't found those things yet, but I keep looking because people adore Napoleon and I, I don't, maybe there's something there, but man, he's a ballsy little dude because he, uh, the stuff that he did trying to march into Russia and then thinking that his supply plan was when he got to Moscow, we're just going to eat their chow. And all of a sudden, guess what? They burnt everything and he had no food for his army and said, okay, well, let's just get out of here. And then everybody was freezing to death. It was terrible. So read those two books about Napoleon. Highly recommend it. Um, I've been on my butt about telling you about books. So this is a lot of them at one time. Man, read something. Pick up a book and read it and study history. Uh, some people have said, if we don't study history, we'll repeat it. And I would say this, if we do study history, we're still going to repeat it. And people will also say that it, it all is, you know, we repeat history. And I would say this, it rhymes. I heard somebody say that. I forget who it was. I was listening to a podcast and they said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. I agree with that. So we can definitely learn from history. So there you go. That's all I got for today. Thanks again for tuning in. If you have comments, send them to lamb, L-A-M-B at vikingtactics.com. Some of these books, I've read these books because some of you listeners have told me to read some of these and they are amazing. Some of them I've had the, the great game sitting on my bookshelf for a few years. I was training some guys from MSD. They recommended it. I've come back. I bought the book and then it sat there for several years and I just read it and I wish I would have read it several years ago. All right. Send your comments to lamb at vikingtactics.com. Please give us a five-star review. Hey, all the comments, we read every one of them and uh, we don't reply to every one of them, but we definitely read every one of them. We really, really appreciate you taking the time to email us. And uh, some of you guys are a little mean, but I kind of like that because you're pointing out stuff that I should know, or maybe I said something incorrectly and I appreciate that. We will bring those up. All right. Last but not least, God bless America.